Today I'm showing how much Palantir is truly worth by using the most accurate method to value a company, the discounted cash flows. The DCF shows how much are future cash flows worth today by discounting them using the company's weighted average cost of capital. Moreover, I've placed the DCF template in the description so that you can insert your own inputs to see how the price changes. Let's start our valuation by looking at the most important input, the revenue estimates. What I've done is I've split the growth into two phases. We, firstly, we have the fast growth phase for the first five years, and then we have the maturity stage. The most important aspect for the revenue growth is the 2025 estimate. I have used the $4.5 billion in revenue in 2025 that management guided for. For the next couple of years, I estimated that the revenue will grow at a slower pace. Lastly, I have calculated the revenue compounded annual growth rate for the next 10 years and I have forecasted a 22.2%. I would argue that the 22% uh, compounded annual growth rate is pretty uh, conservative since, for instance, companies like Google were able to grow at a compounded annual growth rate of more than 40% for the same phase where Palantir is today. The next input that we have is the operating income. Now, what I've done with the operating income is I chose to model it separately from the stock-based compensation. Since the stock-based compensation in, is one of the biggest expenses for the company, I believe that it is easy to model it separately. I've estimated so that Palantir is gap profitable by 2025. I assume that they will be uh, around break-even in 2025. Lastly, what I've done here is I put a maturity operating margin, which is a proxy used from another company that has around 11 billion dollars, what I estimate that the company will have in the terminal year. I've modeled for three scenarios. First, we have the bullish case, then we have the base, and lastly, we have the bearish case. For the bearish case, I went as negative as possible with operating margin being much lower than what it was in 2021. The next input is the adjusted operating income after net operating loss. So it's the losses that uh, have piled up for the company. Next up, we have the cash taxes. The company won't pay any cash taxes until 2029. And then we have the most important element, no part the net operating profit after tax. Coming forward, we have the three elements that affect the cash flow. We have first depreciation, amortization, and capital expenditures. For those two elements, I assumed a slightly higher than before margin, but still it is very, very low as compared to revenue. The only important element for Palantir is the change in working capital. The working capital contains accounts payables, accounts receivables, uh, different revenue, so that's cash received from the customers for which the service hasn't been provided yet, and it also has the deposits from customers. Now, what we can see historically is that it had uh, a pretty volatile change in working capital. What I assumed is that it will normalize slowly. I have highlighted the free cash flow and the free cash flow growth rate, excluding the stock based compensation. Lastly, one of the most important aspects for a software company, and especially for Palantir, is the stock based compensation. The stock based compensation is based on stock options and restricted stock units used by company in order to pay to its employees and to its management. I have also tried to be as conservative as possible here for the base case, as you can see, substantial stock based compensation still, uh, around 30% in 2025. After 2025, it will uh, slowly grow towards a mature state of around 8% that I have forecasted from here. So this data is from the stock based compensation divided by sales for the software industry. And this is based on the research from Damodaran. There are two ways in which a company can pay for the stock based compensation. On one hand, company can can issue shares to cover for the difference between the striking price and the market price. So for instance, if an employee has stock options that allows him to buy stock at $5, but the stock price is $10 right now, what the company can do is issue shares to cover for that $5 spread. The second option that the company has to cover for the stock based compensation is to use cash to cover for that spread. So very important here, I have treated the stock based compensation as a cash expense. This is very helpful for me for two reasons. Firstly, it offers a good image for the real free cash flow. And secondly, I do not need to model the amount of new shares that are going to be issued, which will make my model more accurate. As you can see here, we also have the free cash flow margin as percentage of revenue, and we have a 19% real free cash flow margin for the terminal year. Lastly, the discounted period, and I have the weighted average cost of capital. The weighted average cost of capital has two main components. Firstly, the cost of equity, and secondly, the cost of debt. Luckily, since Palantir doesn't have any debt, we will only be interested in the cost of equity. Now, what I've done is I used two different weighted average cost of capital. First one, which is much higher for the first five years of intense growth, and second one for a mature state, which is obviously lower. So I have calculated the 
weighted average cost of capital for the first five years, which is 14.3%, and then we have the 8.12% for the mature state. And as you can see here, we have the total present value of future cash flows. Next up, I have used two methods in order to find the true intrinsic value. First one, the perpetual growth is the most accurate method since it's only based on the free cash flows of the company. The, the other one is the multiples method, which takes into account multiples from other companies, but as we've seen recently, the multiples can decrease significantly during downturns. The last element for a good free cash flow analysis is the terminal value. The terminal value is calculated using the terminal year free cash flow, which we can see right here, by being discounted with the difference between the terminal discount rate and the selected terminal growth rate. The perpetual growth rate is the growth rate that we assume that the company will grow in perpetuity. A very good proxy for the perpetual growth rate is the US GDP growth rate or the risk-free rate. The risk-free rate is around 3.7% right now, but I chose to use 3%, 2.5% and 1.5%, which I believe is really conservative. Using these assumptions, the terminal value is around 42 billion and the present value is around $14 billion. After we subtract the cash and the cash equivalents, we have the equity value, and if we use the total number of diluted shares, we get the share price. Next, we have a very important aspect. We see here the diluted number of shares. The diluted number of shares is calculated by adding all the stock options and the restricted stock units independently of their statuses to the basic shares outstanding. This is a good way to take into account the dilution for the already issued stock options and receipted stock units. For the perpetual growth, we have a $10 implied price. Next up, we have the multiples method. I used Oracle, Microsoft, and Google as proxy, and I have used for the base case a 13.5 multiple for the terminal EBITDA. Using the same number of diluted shares, we get an $11 price point. I made an average for the two methods, and the result price is $10.5, which is a discount of 44% based on the market price which is 7.3 dollars to conclude my base case this is a pretty conservative way of looking at it but again i have started with the assumption that palantir will have 4.5 billion dollars in revenue in 2025 if you believe that for instance palantir will only achieve four billion dollars you can go in into the google documents that I have placed into the description for instance if we put four billion here now we get a 9.5 dollars price target. Lastly, if we look at the bearish case, I try to put in here as many bad things as possible. For instance, we have a bad operating margin and a really, really high percentage of stock-based compensation that won't decrease below 15%, not even in the terminal year. I'll stick to my base case, which I believe is a good assumption and it is a good representation of Palantir's growth prospects. To conclude, I believe that even if the Palantir stock is undervalued, this is still a difficult market. As you've seen, the volatility has been really high and growth stocks have been really out of favor. Even if the DCF model tells us that the company is undervalued, please be aware that we find ourselves in a very volatile period. Unfortunately, the market tends to overswing in both bullish and bearish direction. It is possible that companies remain below their true intrinsic value for longer periods of time. Next up, I will be doing a full in-depth analysis of Palantir stock to show its weaknesses, its strengths, and if I'm buying shares at this discounted price. Until next time, keep crushing it and subscribe.